Okay, well, good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm glad I've had a chance to uh, say hello to most of you. I'm really looking forward to this cafe today because I've been hearing from Christine and from the people who did the screening that we've got a lot of energy in this room and a lot of people with opinions they want to share. So we really want to hear those opinions. So thank you so much for making the time today. Family is very important in our communities. It's a foundation in our communities. But certainly in this project, we're thinking very inclusively about the way you define family because it's one of those terms we're also realizing can be quite loaded for people too, right? Right? So this is really about the people you care about and the people that you who care about you. This is the way that I often think of it. So what we're going to be doing today is that there are four rounds of questions. So relatively simple questions that we're hoping are going to evoke great conversations at your tables and give you the opportunity to share and learn from each other. And we'll be, we'll be talking about that in the room, but eventually, as we are pulling together all of the things that happen at these different cafes, we're gathering wisdom, ideas, <coughs> solutions, uh, challenges from around the province. And what we want to do is to put that into formats in which it can reach policymakers, in which it can reach health professionals, and the public. And I would say for me, the public education piece is very important because I think there's sort of basic work to be done around liter literacy and understanding of mental health that would make being able to live with mental illness and being able to be in a family that's affected by mental illness so much easier. So with that, I'm going to launch you into your first discussion and then we will let you know when we're coming back together. Labeling caregiver and care receiver. It's very singular. It's a negative positive connotations, but we love the caregiving family because family's anything that you think it is, right? If I have a great psychiatrist for my daughter, they're part of my family, darn right they are, and they can come to dinner whenever they like. Mm -hmm. So, and it's more holistic, it's a circle. It's, it shows that you're not always a caregiver. You're not always a receiver. Sometimes you're taking on the role of both and everybody gets a turn of that. So we don't want to say somebody's a care receiver and negate their good day that they're having. We understand the labels are there for policy for numerous reasons and to access services. Sometimes you have to be labeled, but as far as we're concerned, a caregiving family is just demonstrates that it's not one person in each role. It's a circle, not a box. So we talked a lot about the barriers that as caregivers we face um, from day one. So uh, caring for someone with a mental illness, you face barriers from the moment that you realize something is wrong through the entire journey that you go through. So our overarching jewel was barriers. So barriers to care, barriers to access, barriers to mental health support, barriers to peer support for that person in the community, um, barriers to financial support, and the list goes on and on and on. So for us, the thing that makes it most difficult to care for someone with a mental illness is all of the barriers that we face. Okay, wonderful. The fluctuations of our own moods that some days we'll feel exhausted, some days we'll feel responsible, some days we'll think, um, did I say something that was wrong? Uh, so it's the, that fluctuation and not having things that are measurable and controllable that is very difficult. Yes. We talk about the bad old days when families were blamed, but it sounds like you know what that feels like. Oh, yes. It wasn't so long ago. Yes, and without the support of others in the family. Yes, that's It was very uh, extremely uh, a kind of um, a lonely journey at first mm -hmm. until education set in and others and talking to others in the support group. One time I read 17 bipolar books trying to to cure my daughter hmm. because we had to change all these psychiatrists, you know, to find the right. And I found a woman psychiatrist and we're very lucky that she talks to both of us. There were some psychiatrists who wouldn't talk to me. and I stress so much family inclusion mm -hmm. because we really are in the forefront of um, <clears throat> of the work and the and the devotion having a loved one suffering mental illness 
is probably one of the most difficult things any family can go through. It is not a person disease. It is a family disease because one person is identified as the patient and everybody suffers. The only thing that I can say is if anyone ever has a loved one that is identified as having a patient, having a mental illness, contact a friend that really understands, reach out for peer support, not just the professionals. You need to be around people who understand what you're going through. None of us can do it alone. We have to have help because it's too negative. It'll drain us, it'll pull us down. You have to be supported by peers. The more I talk about mental illness and the struggles that I face as someone who's had mental illness and, and a family member has faced, I think there's, I feel better and um, I think uh, the word needs to get out there so that stigmatization is lessened. Uh, there's no other better way than hearing the stories um, of people who are affected by mental illness. Information and networking between all involved parties to know what's available for, for the individual that is the care taker, I suppose. Uh, that person who receives the care, we can't give it to them unless we know what's available in the society. Sometimes it's just so hard to find a psychiatrist. There are no psychiatrists, we've been told by our family doctor. The only way he could get help was to actually go to an emergency mm -hmm. in a crisis. And uh, then if they can receive treatment, uh, and unfortunately for our son, he had to be institutionalized to get the treatment. And they're so reluctant to institutionalize people. They're advocates calling on him saying you don't have to be here if you don't want to almost encouraging him to go back and if we didn't care for him he'd be on the street and how many homeless people are on the street because they they have a mental illness and the families have given up or they they've tried and they you know failed and there are no institutions and there is no help mm -hmm. for the individual so treatment does help how wonderful it is uh, to have the consultation with people that have experienced this uh, it is invaluable information to take mm -hmm. with you and to push uh, the right policies and the right help and I think no matter how intelligent a person is at the top if they don't go to the front lines and consult with doctors nurses uh, caregivers families uh, we're not going to get the holistic picture of what is needed and what the problems are and what the barriers are. Really special thank you to all of you because I, I really believe that when you come and you do something like this, you're speaking for other families, but I also know that you are also saying things and sharing things that are going to help people that couldn't be here and really need to hear them. So thank you so much for that time and I look forward to sharing more with you as we keep moving through this project. So thank you. Applause for all of you. Okay. <laughs>
And that's part of what this project is trying to understand. We want to understand what is happening, how families are coping, what families need, and really all family members, how they think about and, and deal with and dream about the possibilities for how they can live and thrive and cope in the context of mental illness. In this mental health business, if I can use that word, uh, there's a family which is given and there's a family by choice, the community of support. And in that, every caregiver is also care receiver. And in short term, things are different. In long term, things are very different. And the way we view at giving or receiving impacts our mental health also, whether we are receiver or giver. So we thought we should use the term care sharing feeling beaten down uh, and frustrated over the length of the term of the illness before diagnosis, before we start to move towards recovery. It can be a long, a long time. Um, lack of medical help and support. The road to recovery is long sometimes. Um, as we know, it often shows up when our children are transitioning from high school to something else and careers get stalled, families don't grow, they don't get married, they don't do the things that they expected. But some do recover and go back to school and do get themselves organized. So I just want to really encourage the public in general to have a better understanding of what we mean by mental illness. I just want to remind us all that there is hope in all the challenges that we face. I see mental health as any other health issue that needs to be dealt with. And so my argument is, if my child was diagnosed with cancer, would I seek help? So I want to encourage those families who may think mental health is a stigma and you're going to be looked down on, that it's better to go and get information that you can work with so you can better understand and you can better help your family member who's not well. Um, and I want to say that having been in this for more than 20 years, I would say, I do not see enough black families coming forward for that help. And I'd like to encourage them to know that it is safe to come to these groups. I have attended groups for many years. I was very much a part of a board of a family support group. And it will make a big difference because you will get some understanding of how to cope. Our family is no stranger to mental illness. Mm -hmm. My mother had postpartum depression. My aunt had insomnia. My uncle had, was bipolar. And my brother had schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. And in my case, I'm also bipolar. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't say to myself, you're independent. You can, and you, I'm all right, Jack, or anything like that. We're all aging. In my case, the most difficult part of mental illness is when your caregivers get older and older and older, and they, they, all of a sudden they can't take care of themselves. And if they can't take care of themselves, how can they take care of the of the person uh, in the family? You know, we have so much compassion when we can see an injury or we can see an illness. You know, that broken arm, everybody opens doors for me. Everybody wants to know how you're doing. Everybody wants to hear how you did it. But if you're walking around with a racing heart, uh, having horribly frightening and invasive thoughts about wanting to die, absolutely sure you're going to die. Well, we don't tell anybody about that. And when we do, they have no idea how to handle it. We need to be able to create communities that are places where we can live with mental illness in ways that make us feel like we're participating fully, like we can talk about these issues, like we can, you know, that we don't have to hide what's going on in our families. So I feel like public education is a very important piece of that. So I thank you all for your contributions to this because this is going to be, I think, very important work. We're in a moment now, we just heard about funding, we're in a moment now where people are talking about mental health and I hope that we're all going to be part of positive changes that are coming up. So thank you for your contribution to that, and I look forward to being able to tell you about where that goes as we're moving forward.